Okay, so uh, online, of course, there is a, a PowerPoint that kind of goes through documentary propaganda, which actually my wife put that together, right? So as you know, she um, is a student of the films. And uh, so she's helping me with that. She's helped me with this class every time I've taught it. <laughs> this is probably the fifth time, fourth or fifth time I've taught the class. So anyway, she does those little PowerPoints, which become kind of a part of your video assignments, or quizzes, we're calling them. And so the quizzes, you want to make sure you look at the read the textbook and look at the video, and then you can answer the questions. Remember, on the quizzes, you can use your textbook, and you can also um, use your notes. They are timed, but, you know... Other than that, I see it as a learn. I see it more as a uh, vehicle to get you to study than a vehicle to test your knowledge. I guess this is a new way I'm trying to see quizzes and tests after years of not seeing it that way. So there we go. So let's take a look at this <clears throat> documentaries and um, propaganda: the good, the bad, and the bias. That's take off of a movie title. But you probably don't know if you've seen the movie. The good, the bad, and the ugly, yes, with Clint. Clint is the is the guy with no name in those films. There's three of those films, I believe. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Well, yeah, and they, well, anyway, spaghetti westerns. All right. Let's go to the next one. Let's talk about assumptions. Uh, what do you assume about a documentary? What is a documentary? When you think of documentary, uh, what do you think of? Yeah. Like, most of the documentary would be uh, a group of people that either while it's happening or after it's happening are just like telling a true story. So it's probably from their bias, but they're telling story that actually happened so they're okay they're using clips like the one that first comes to my mind is free solo um uh -huh. so like they went with alex arnold as he climbed the, the dawn wall okay solo. So he, they followed him. free solo see i always thought that was a, a star a star wars thing free solo when he was uh trapped in the carbonite block that was the yeah, free solo. We need to, we need to get him out of that. Job of the Hutt's got him. No, that's a whole other thing. Yeah, let me just put this up. Whoops, the picture didn't come up. Oh, huh. what happened to my picture? Hold on, just a second. The light's not coming up. Should come up. Let me um, let me see what I can do. With this. Let's see if I animate it. If it'll work, then okay. Now let's do it. Now let's see if it comes up. There we go. I don't know what happened. I don't know why it didn't appear. Before. So these are just some documentaries of a, of a variety of kinds, right? So a documentary could be a lot of different things. Uh, like you said, yes, I think it, it is um, showing something that happened. Okay, but you know, I think we have in our minds sometimes that a documentary is true. A documentary can be trusted. A documentary is showing us the facts. Remember, I talked about the old police show where the guy said Jack Webb. He just said, "Just give me the facts, man. Dragnet, just just the facts." So, do you think that documentaries are? basically true, they're basically good, they're exposing something that people don't know, making them aware of it? There's some truth in all of them documentaries, but some of them uh -huh. have a direction that they want the audience to take with it, a way that they want them to okay. receive it, um, and they can put that into the documentary and present Right. Okay. So they, they have a perspective, I, I think. Yeah. D are there any documentaries you can think of? Uh, he mentioned 
free Han Solo. Um, how about another one? I want to say you personally you saw it or something. Do you think it changed your thinking or made you aware of something that you weren't aware of? The, What's it? The true what? The true cost. And cost. The, the true the cost. Sure. Right. Right. You mean the sweatshops, as they're sometimes called? Yeah. Yeah, where the they take the clothes, like say you know the Nike shoes, the name brand things, or the whatever, and then uh, they charge you. I don't know couple hundred dollars for these shoes and it cost them a dollar or something to make them or less. Or even like things like the, the almost every fashion brand that's popular. Uh-huh. Like sweatshops. So sweatshops. Yeah. 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 And, and a lot of our clothing uh, is made uh, in, in that way. Yeah, that's right. Uh, where people are paid very little money. And they're making this stuff. Uh, it's happening a lot in Latin America, various places. Um, you know, they make a lot of cloth, actual cloth, in Turkey, actually. When I was in Turkey, I went by big warehouse. Big, they look like warehouses, but they were, and I asked what that was, and they said this was a fabric. I don't know if they were actually making, I think they were making garments too, but they were also just making the fabric that would then be shipped somewhere else to be made into other things. And the, the, the guide told me that it was a, what do you call it? A duty-free zone or something. Anyway, it was a, it was designated as a special area <clears throat> where if you produced it there, say for example, it was going to the United States, there would be no tariffs, there would be no duties, there's no limit. You know, it wasn't counted like it was being imported. Basically, it was just counted like this was a, a factory in the U.S., even though it wasn't in the U.S. And so I don't know how many of those there are or what else it's for. All right, so a documentary might highlight something like that. Okay, that's usually, and you see these titles, um, Robin Williams, Come Inside My Mind, Going Clear, Scientology, and the prison of belief. See, that one sounds non-biased. They sound very pro-Scientology. <laughs> yeah, and of course, we're very close to the Scientology headquarters here. It's in Clearwater. That's uh, that's the headquarters of Scientology. Well, there should be. Yeah, they need the, they need the publicity. Was Tom Cruise in it? No, that's too bad. It's too bad. But yeah, over, over in Clearwater, they have a big headquarters. It's a big building, and uh, they have a training center and, nat and sort of nat or international headquarters right here, not too far away. Uh, clear, I think it's Clearwater, Florida. Yeah. So there you go. you got to be careful. They may be listening, and I'm sure they are. So we're all for it. We love the commercial, by the way. I didn't see it, but I'm sure it was nice. I didn't see much, you know. I try. I went to that thing, and I didn't. I missed. I missed everything. I saw like it seems to me like I saw a flash of Brian Cranston in a dress, but I don't know if that was just a hallucination or if it was real. And then like I saw a flood of Mountain Dew, like a build, like a room being filled up with. Yeah, that was a shining. Uh, the Mountain Dew was a shining commercial. Oh. So they replaced the blood yeah. with Mountain Dew. Oh, so that's the, that's supposed to encourage you to buy the Mountain Dew? Yeah. <laughs> Mountain Dew's like blood? What? Oh, he was the, oh, oh, he, like the twin girls in the hallway of The Shining. See, I just saw a flash of it. I saw like Brian Cranston in a dress, and then I saw like like a flood of Mountain Dew. And I'm thinking, I don't know if this encourages me to buy Mountain Dew. It's a, it's a new Mountain Dew. Mountain Dew Zero. So zero. Yeah, zero. so it's supposed to be like, it's supposed to be the sequel. It's better than the I sequel. see. Okay. 
So it's 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 supposed to be better than diet Mountain Dew, like because they took the word diet out and put zero in. Okay. The, oh, so they're they're trying to advertise they're trying to advertise new Coke. Is that what it is? Oh, Pepsi and Mountain Dew, they're owned by the same Pepsi Co. Well, they they own a lot, except for what Coke owns. Coke owns a lot too. So let's not leave Coke out because those people in Atlanta are getting upset right now. That's the headquarters of. Coca-Cola. Yeah, Coca-Cola has a lot of stuff. Okay, so I didn't see those commercials, but um, all right. I think what a lot of people normally assume is that documentaries are true and they're good because they are highlighting normally something that people think or a lot of people think should be highlighted, but they certainly have a perspective. A documentary about Scientology done by the, the Church of Scientology is going to be a little different than probably, I'm guessing, I haven't seen this one going clear. Uh, my guess would be it's a lot different than that. Um, okay, now how about the next? What about um, propaganda? When we use the word propaganda, what do you assume about that? Is that good or bad? Um, is there, is there a good function of propaganda, or is propaganda always bad? Yes, PSAs, public service announcements. Actually, I think maybe the next screen, I don't know if I got it up there or not, but I had something about that. Yeah, public service announcements. You might have propaganda trying to get you to get a flu shot. You know, Taylor says, no, I won't be, I will not be manipulated like that. Um, or that smoking is bad. Or, or, uh, or, you know, and rather than highlighting the good things about vaping, they only tell you bad things about it. Yes, Taylor. The, the truth? I don't know. I don't know what those are. Is it company that's targeting young adults? <clears throat> yeah. Um, attempting to get them to ditch cigarettes and vapes. To ditch it. Yes, that's that's the word they use. That's why. It's like ditch that. the vape and the and the cigarettes, and then put one in its place, like uh, most, heroin. They're trying, they're trying uh, to attack the cigarette. Um, oh, I see. Industry, which okay. Is the tobacco industry in general. The most recent okay. I've seen is people taking like jewels or vapes, yeah. putting them on like two liter. Coke cans or like Coke bottles and yeah. putting mentos in them and like shaking them and then throwing them in the air and they like explode. Okay. They, no, we don't they, remember they tape them to their chest and then jump in a pool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. I've seen that one like eight times now. There's they they there's tape, do. They tape like vape, vape, vape like to his chest yeah. and then jumps in a pool while everyone cheers for him. Really you seen the Muppet ones? Because it yeah. wrecks Muppet the thing? Ones. Does it blow up? What happens? No, he just yeah. jumps in the pool and then that ruins it. Oh. See, the ones that were for, like, just cigarettes before they were like, horrifying. And I feel like they were effective, but I feel like the ones they tried Yeah, they were, like, scared straight. Like, yeah, they were, yeah. Like, well, I remember they have, they have the woman who, you know, it's like she... She's got, she can't talk. Like they show a picture of her before and then they show, <laughs> show her now and she's talking. She's got to talk through the. the Truth is dumb. Okay. Well, how about this for propaganda? Is that propaganda? So is that is that good or bad? Is that true? Can can we really do it? Can she really do it? And is she really real? I mean, yeah, there was a model and stuff, Rosie the Riveter, but um, I know it was based on. There's actually more than one woman that says it was based on her at this point, but. 
you know, based on obviously women working in factories during World War II because, you know, a lot of men were in the service, men were in the military, and so they needed women to come and do it. So this was to encourage the women that, yes, you can do these jobs and you can get the job done and we need you to do this because we need to win the war and to win the war we need the equipment of war okay so there there's pro i think that's propaganda that somebody might say well that's good propaganda you see because it was because you kind of agree with what it's propaganding propagandizing how about this one? This is one of my favorites. When you ride alone, you ride with Hitler. Join a car sharing club today. See, there's Hitler in outline right next to the guy. So that takes a whole new thing to the bumper sticker. Jesus is my co-pilot. It would be Hitler is my co-pilot. And by the way, should Jesus really be your co-pilot? Shouldn't he just be the pilot? Speaking of that, I had a guy just about hit me this morning. I probably shouldn't bring it up. I was changing lanes, and he decided he was going to pass me on the left uh, in an intersection. I mean, I was just past the intersection. And, and you know, he was quite a ways behind me. I didn't even see him, and I, I was moving over. I was almost completely in the lane. And then I saw him, and he he was flying by me. So I don't know who his co-pilot was. Maybe it was Hitler, because he was in the car by himself. Of course, I was in the car by myself, so that means I guess I was riding with Hitler as well. So, uh, yeah, of course, here's the idea is you need to save uh, gasoline, you know, save. Why? Because we need gasoline for the war. We need uh, and the, and the fuel. Uh, if we use up all our fuel at home, we won't have enough fuel for at home. All right, there we go. Now here, this is one that somebody in the back row will probably identify with. <laughs> uh, this is uh, Comrade Lenin. And... Um, so basically, you know, he, he see a lot of this propaganda stuff, the people are looking off. They're not looking right at you is what I've noticed. It's kind of like they're looking off into the distance and they've got like something really wonderful on their mind or they're very thoughtful uh, and they have a plan. See, this is this is V.I. Lenin. Um, I'm not sure what that one says. I don't know. I know almost no Russian. My guess is it's talking about his, uh, you know, his economic plan. But it's a quote from him because down below it has his name, Lenin. So I'm not sure, but whatever it is, I know it's good. It's good because Lenin looks like he's very thoughtful here. Okay, how about this one? Uh, you know the one on the one on the right, uh, of course, uh, Obama. The one on the left, Che. Uh, very similar kind of posters uh, that you'll see. But again, the same sort of like looking off. They're not looking at you. They're looking off, maybe into the future, maybe into the past, maybe into the the deep plans that they have. I don't know. But I found that these two. Uh, were put side by side, you know, because they're kind of similar, limited colors to it, bold, and, you, you know, with just a simple mess like hope, you know, hope of what, hope for what. See, this is often, uh, often propaganda has like a central figure and it has a simple message. Okay, so there you go. And then, of course, here's, here's a good one. Uh, Hitler looking off into the future. And, of course, this one says, uh, you know, the, the, the children, the youth, uh, follow the, the youth for the Fuhrer, the youth for Hitler. Hitler youth, of course. This is, uh, this is to advertise the Hitler youth. 
and how the youth can be uh, guided and the youth are the future of Germany, right? Of course, we have to follow our leader, in this case, the guy that was riding with me in the car this morning, uh, Hitler. So this is a very different uh, view of Hitler than the other one we saw. Now, all of these are... Um, all of these are, I think I would call them propaganda or whatever, but, you know, propaganda uh, means to propagate or to send out, uh, to sort of get the message out. So there is a sense in which propaganda, uh, we, all, we often almost always use it as in a negative, but I think part of it depends on if you agree with what the message of it is. Like Rosie the Riveter, you might say, well, that's, that's not bad. Uh, Hitler riding, don't, don't have Hitler riding in the car with you. You might say, well, okay, I can understand. That's not bad. Um, but some of these other ones, you might say, no, well, that's, that's a negative. Okay. All right. So I guess what I'm trying to highlight, and this is sort of what the theme is for, at least for this week, um, is uh, what is propaganda? What is documentary? Are the two sort of mutually exclusive, and is one always good and the other one always bad? I guess, I guess the sort of answer that I'm pushing for is, well, both of them have a perspective, a bias. Both of them are pushing an agenda. So, well, how about these? We mentioned public service announcements. Well, I got PDA. That's not right. That's something very different. That's that's banned uh, you know, in this case. It's not SEU approved. PSAs, sorry. See, I got I get my rules mixed up, getting my statements mixed up. So this is public service announcements. And I I've worked at what, like three or four radio stations. I used to have to do public service announcements. And the FCC, although officially doesn't say you've got to have so many of these, they do have a statement that says that you need to show that your, uh, let's say, radio station, television station, and so forth, is serving the public interest or something like that. So this is what leads to, like, say, children's programming on television. Usually on Saturday mornings, they'll put some kind of children... Uh, assumedly educational sort of thing on, say, like Saturday morning cartoon, which is sort of educational. Um, also, these public service... Can you think of public service announcements which have... You guys mentioned the... What are they calling it? The truth. What other ones can you think of besides those about the vaping? Which basically, I assume, is saying, don't vape. Yeah. <laughs> They're not pointing out the, uh, the, the, uh, you know, the, the plus sides of the vaping. Uh, which means you're not smoking cigarettes. What's that? Political ads. Well, a political ad is not really a public service announcement. You see, I have it up here, according to the FCC rules, at least that I could find, uh, a public service announcement, there has to be no charge for it. It's free. And it's uh, a, technically, it's to promote a program, activity, or service of the government, federal, state, or local. Now, usually it gets extended also to sort of civic groups, you know, YMCA maybe, or... Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, uh, Kiwanis Club. You know, I used to have to read these things on the radio, and it'd be like we're having a, the Kiwanis Club is having a pancake breakfast on Saturday morning, you know, at the fire station, firehouse, something like that. And so that was considered a public service announcement because you were freely offering this information to help a, uh, an organization, which supposedly this organization does good things for the community. Okay. So there's a lot of judgment in some of that. But otherwise, uh, 
you can have. So you've thought of some of these. Let me pause this and let's see if I can. Flu can be very serious. Everyone six months and older should get the best available flu protection, a flu vaccine, every year. Hashtag fight flu. Learn more at cdc.gov slash flu. Let me start this again. Okay, here we go. What do you wish for? A nice life? Nice things? Or do you wish for something more? A sense of purpose? Do you wish to discover a cure? To write code that cracks an unsolvable question? To further our exploration into space? Or to invent something that changes everything right here on Earth? Well, if that's your wish, make yourself ready. Because when you look back, you'll see that you didn't just make wishes. You realize them. Okay, there's some obvious propaganda. See, nobody makes commercial about the humanities. Yes. Oh, I thought you had your hand up. All right. Now I'm going to show you two classic, what I consider to be classic PSAs that I think everybody at the time knew about. Here we go. Mother said she found it in your closet. I don't know when a guy in the source of what. Look, Dad, it's not Roger Cannon. Dad, answer me. Who taught you how to do this stuff? You are right. I learned it by watching you. Parents who use drugs have children who use drugs. There you go. Well, this reaches all planet. on a journey to the furthest reaches of our planet, or navigate the strange relationships between professional gamers. It can put us in the shoes of a murderer, or lead us through the complex ethics of the global agricultural industry. They present a dramatized reality, the idea of uncovering some subjective truth by selecting images and stories that tell us something about our world. And perhaps the best example of this is the first feature-length documentary, Nanook of the North, from 1922. Hello and welcome to 100 Years of Cinema. We'll be taking a look at at least one film a year from 1915 to track the evolution of film over the last century. In 1910, Robert Flaherty was hired as a railroad prospector to explore the East Hudson Bay, an area around the size of England, with a population of roughly 300 native Inuits. In 1915, Flaherty started filming the lives of Inuit people. After accidentally burning the first draft of this film, he decided to reshoot in 1920, this time focusing on one man, Nanook, and his family. And although he didn't know it at the time, he was creating the conventions of the modern documentary. Most films that were made immediately after the invention of the film camera, between 1890 and 1910, focused on capturing small slices of life called actualities. These first films introduced the idea of the passive camera, placing the camera in front of a boxing match or workers leaving a factory and recording the results without influence of the filmmaker. When Flaherty started filming what would become the world's first feature-length documentary, he took this idea and he expanded it, arranging images and stories taken from what was seemingly a passive camera to construct a narrative that told us something larger about the Inuit community and how they lived. The film was an immediate hit, both in the US and abroad, but it also came under heavy criticism. Although the film was presented as an unmediated window into the Inuit community, the reality is that most of the film's sequences were constructed and staged by Flaherty. In real life, Nanook was called Alakagi Alak, and Nanook's wife in the film was really Flaherty's common law wife. The film shows Nanook and his family constructing a real igloo, but Flaherty's 60-pound hand-cranked camera was far too big to fit inside, and it would have been impossible to film without lights. To fix this, Flaherty had the Inuits construct a large three-walled temporary igloo, to fit in his camera and allow natural lighting to film it. They then pretended to bed down for the night and go to sleep. 
Flaherty's influence on the film went beyond just making it easy to capture. Flaherty wanted to preserve the rapidly disappearing culture of the Inuit from before when they came into contact with Western man. But by this time, the Inuits were already familiar with Western culture. Most had traded in their native furs for Western clothes and their harpoons for guns. So when it came time for Nanook to hunt a walrus, Flaherty had him hunt with a traditional harpoon instead of the more standard rifle he was used to using. Although in one sense the film was staged, it was still a real walrus being hunted with a real harpoon built in the traditional Inuit way. Another example of staging is in the scene in which Nanook takes seal furs to a trading post. The trader shows Nanook how he cans a man's voice with a gramophone. Nanook leans in to get a closer look and tries to take a bite out of a record. At this time, Nanook had been trading with white people for years and he was well aware of what a gramophone was. Although many scenes were captured under instruction for Flaherty, what happened on camera were real events that depicted authentic details of Inuit life. And it's easy to think that the stage nature of Nanook of the North reduces its value as a documentary. But it was in this way he forged the path of the documentary we have today. In the 1950s and 60s, two new kinds of documentaries emerged, inspired by Flaherty's work. The first called direct cinema, shortly followed by cinema verite, or observational cinema. They shared the idea that in a documentary, both the audience and the subject should be unaware of the camera's presence. The films are normally shown as a sequence of shots without voiceover or context. The difference being that cinema verite allowed the filmmaker to interact with its subject, while direct cinema does not. A perfect example of cinema verite is Grey Gardens from 1975, which attempted to chronicle the life of two aging socialites that live alone in a dilapidated house. Cinema verite and direct cinema both employ fly in the wall style filmmaking to try and uncover an objective truth. They are a filmmaker's attempt to replicate reality on a film. But you can never truly capture objective reality. Every edit the filmmaker makes, every choice of shot, even the choice of story, goes toward constructing a subjective narrative. Even the simple presence of a camera breaks the reality. These films may be non-fiction, but they're no more true than the works of Robert Flatt. Thanks for watching 100 Years of Cinema. What do you think? Can a film ever truly capture objective reality? Let me know in the comments below.